Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, the definitely going to do it on first take podcast brought to you by the magazine of Free Minds and Free Markets. I'm Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangue Ward. Hello again, Howdy. friends. Hey, Matt. Happy Monday. All right. So this is uh, complicated enough that you're going to have to forgive me for reading it. <sighs> okay. I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm going to read Put part some, of this. Uh, oomph in uh, though, Matt. Thank you. Uh, Thursday, uh, former President Donald J. Trump was convicted by a jury of his peers in Manhattan on all 34 counts, one for each hush money check that his organization sent indirectly to pornographic actress Stormy Daniels of falsifying business records, which itself is a misdemeanor with the intent to aid or conceal another crime which in the legally prevailing view of Manhattan District uh, Attorney Alvin Bragg elevated those misdemeanors into felonies. That other crime Trump was convicted of intending to avoid was Section 17 152 of the New York Election Law, which makes it a misdemeanor for two or more persons to conspire to promote or prevent the election of any person to a public office by unlawful means. Those Unlawful means, in turn, were never settled on during the trial. Indeed, Judge Juan Merchan instructed jurors they didn't need to agree on which means. The three main ones on offer were tax fraud, illegal campaign contributions, or attempting to falsify still more business records. What we're left with on Monday morning is the first ever criminal conviction of a former American president and the first ever criminal conviction of a presumptive major party nominee for the presidency. Uh, sentencing, sentencing is scheduled for July 9th, uh, just before the Republican National Convention. Catherine, let's stop me reading and start you with the basics or start all of us with the basics. Was this a good verdict? Was it an appropriate case? I don't know how to answer either of those questions, despite having consumed infinite amounts of chitter chatter about uh, those two questions in the last several days. I, I think, you know, the thing that the thing that uh that I've said before on this podcast and that I still think is true is it it can both be true that Trump was like probably guilty of the thing that uh, he was convicted of and also that it was probably a politically motivated um, farce on some level as well. And, uh, you know, I think convicting former presidents, I'm actually all for convicting uh, people who are actively running for office. I have a little bit uh, more mixed feelings about. And um, and this is a, this is a little bit of both. So um, I, I am I am one of these people who is annoyingly uh, actually, if you want to read the definitive on the other hand, on the other hand, on the other hand, take on this. I strongly recommend uh, Matt Labash's Substack post, which has. I think about 10,000 hands uh, and captures my my feeling about it, which is uh, screw this guy and also screw the people who tried to screw this guy. Uh, Peter, I'm seeing a lot of reaction on the kind of center left and anti-Trump right along the lines of, well, maybe this wasn't the strongest case, but it's the one we have. And otherwise, he's doing all the crimes all the time. Uh, so uh, and, you know, Republicans failed to impeach him when they had a chance in 2021, especially. Uh, so it's sort of a Al Capone, get him on tax evasion uh, kind of situation. Is that a valid kind of justification or reaction to this? Uh, so I think verdict? regular listeners to this podcast know my feelings of Do about Donald Trump. I find him incredibly distasteful as a human being. I think he was a bad president. I think he has uh, in some sort of moral, ethical, like not legal or, you know, um, not a not formal sense, but in some sort of social uh, sense, kind of disqualified himself um, from uh, from being able to you know, from being someone who should be able to run for president. I just find him awful in basically every way. Uh, but finding someone awful and finding someone icky and thinking that they seem kind of bad and really maybe kind of crimey, right? Like, like they just seem, seem like they kind of, right? Like Donald Trump seems like he's kind of crimey. And that wasn't quite the argument that the prosecutors made here. There were some specifics attached but it comes really close to saying, hey, New Yorkers, doesn't Donald Trump seem kind of crimey? And can't we get him on seeming gross and slimy and distasteful and kind of crimey? Because, you know, there are these there are these ledger entries 
and he slept with a porn star and now he's denying it. And then he denied the election and he was president and all of this together. Whew, you know, it's just you put it all together in something, right? You put it all together in something is kind of the argument here. There is a there is a uh, does anybody here know the the cocktail? It's not really a cocktail. The college fraternity booze concoction that is sometimes referred to as jungle juice. Drink it mm. out of a trash yeah. can, yeah. baby. Yeah, right? Sure. Yeah. So you, the way you make jungle juice is you take whatever you got in the house <laughs> and you just kind of <laughs> dump it all into a bathtub or a trash can or a bin. And then maybe there's some ice or it's whatever, like somebody else brings some ice cream or some lemonade or what. It just all goes in. And, the, and, and then you drink it. And the point is, we don't know what this is going to taste like, but it's going to get us drunk. And that was this case. It was this. They didn't know what this was going to taste like. They didn't know why they were mixing this with that. Right. It was just here's all the stuff that we found in the cabinet. We're going to put it all in the same trash can. We're going to we're going to drink out of it. And we're going to hope that at the end we got drunk because that is its brute, you know, its brute, a kind of vulgar purpose. And this case served its vulgar purpose in terms of generating a conviction, a felony conviction for the person who is running for president. But I, I just I. I think that so much of it was was really just predicated on this idea of he seems bad. He seems crimey. Therefore, let's convict him on uh, misdemeanors. The statute of, of, of limitations has run out six years ago. The only reason they could do this was because they claimed the felony. But the only way they can claim the felony is by saying that these misdemeanors were connected to some other crime, which, you know, it's a TBD crime. You don't even know which one it's going to be, right? It's TK crime. In journalism, like this is so pe for people who are not journalists, when you have a, a fact in your piece that you have haven't looked up yet. You're going to come back later. You put in TK trillions of dollars deficit, right? When you can't remember what it is this month, because that's always what you're writing about, the deficit, right? Uh, it's TK. And you come back later. And this was this was a kind of TK felony for Donald Trump was, well, we'll come back and we'll, we'll put it in later, except they never even did. The jury instructions were, you know, there's a bunch of things that could fill in this TK and it doesn't matter which. It's the it's it's just a it's a real problem um, the way that this the, this was uh, put together and the way that this case was brought. Uh, and I think it is it's it is it is kind of a political prosecution in in a lot of ways, um, especially when you start with the way that Alvin Bragg didn't promise to prosecute, but definitely put himself out there as the person who was best positioned to pursue potential prosecutions of cases against Donald Trump. Uh, Nick, uh, Trump in a Friday press conference over at the Tower uh, called the verdict a disgrace, a sham, a rigged trial, and a witch hunt, and then uh, further elaborated on Truth Social that it was unconstitutional, a total hoax, election interference, and a victory for the fascists. Uh, President Joseph Robinette Biden uh, II, meanwhile, called Trump's comments reckless and dangerous and irresponsible, adding that the justice system should be respected and we should never allow anyone to tear it down. It's as simple as that. That's America. That's who we are. Yeah. Uh, who that, is more right? Uh, you know, and it's also kind of great that I believe Hunter Biden and Dr. Jill are showing up to start another uh, trial uh, this, you know, uh, this very morning. Uh, for jury selection right. and stuff like that. So we'll see how I, I, you know, you say it five times every week, Matt, and I still have no idea what Joe Biden's middle name is or what level of Joe Biden he is in terms of junior or the <laughs> fourth or He's whatever. a boss level Joe Biden at this point, I would yeah, say. <laughs> I don't know. He's like Pope Pius the 23rd or something. It's um, actually dynamic based on your character level. So if you go back after you've Suderman, reached the I level. Suderman, I swear to God. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that- uh, Producer there, Ian knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> there's uh, no question that uh, Donald Trump, like in my mind, Mind. And this is not I, I don't I don't like keep a lot of my hard drive, you know, uh, segmented for this kind of information. I don't doubt that Donald Trump had sex with Stormy Daniels. I don't doubt that he was bad in bed with Stormy Daniels. <laughs> I don't doubt that he paid hush money to Stormy Daniels through Michael Cohen. Uh, and I also don't think uh, that this should have been a case at all. And I think it's very, very bad. Uh, independent of Donald Trump, when you start coming up with novel ways of proving election interference or doing stuff 
to jack things up from misdemeanors to felonies, especially when it has to do with politics and speech or the idea that you're going to somehow influence the outcome of an election. My one uh, prediction, I, I think this will probably either be overturned or sever severely altered in whatever it means, you know, when, as it goes through the appellate process. But I, I am sure that to the extent that whatever this ruling means stands up, it is going to come back to bite a bunch of Democrats on the ass, uh, you know, because this is this is the way it works. And we have been in this again and again. It's like every freaking week, you know, it's like Gilligan, you know, that they're finally getting off the island. This is the ticket. And then it blows up in their face. Dr. Bellows never catching Tony Nelson. Uh, you know, it's it. Uh, uh, what's his name? Norman Fell, Mr. Roper on Three's Company. Uh, you know, like it never works. I wish they would just stop and say, you know what? Donald Trump is a terrible candidate. He did this, this, and this, which was bad for the country. Beat him at the box office or whatever we're calling it now uh, for politics, rather than trying to do <laughs> these machinations again and again. The box office is where uh, Mad Max Furiosa is playing. Yeah, no, and I'm going to get to that later. So I <laughs> apologize, but who cares? I mean, but no, but seriously, it's a really bad thing to, you know, to start saying politicians doing stuff is, you know, somehow wrapped up with campaign finance, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's bad. Um, one of the blessedly good things about the 21st century uh, and also one of the reasons why we're polarized for sure and why the po parties are dying is because individuals have more ability to influence elections uh, because of legal law, you know, legal changes and constitutional challenges that have been upheld or, or, or struck, you know, laws about campaign finance struck down and things like that. And any of this kind of stuff should be bad, regardless of whether it's Trump or Biden or RFK or uh, uh, Professor Michael wrecked the regime, Rechtenwald, and all of his stuff. I see that Nick's <laughs> Nick's hard drive is is spritzing <laughs> out over there, Catherine. Uh, let's get you off the fence and over on Nick's side of the uh, fence um, for a second, which is to say, um, here's the, the react to the following written by Matt Taibbi, uh, I believe, on Friday. Of all the things Donald Trump has been accused of. None are as serious or system imperiling as abusing the courts to dispose of a political rival. True? Untrue? I think that the prosecution of Trump is politically motivated, but I don't think that Biden is the prime mover. And I, I think that that matters a lot. Um, you know, I, I think it would be crucially and importantly different if there was strong evidence that this was coming, uh, that any of these prosecutions were coming kind of directly at Joe Biden's orders to eliminate uh, a rival in the electoral process. Um, maybe maybe after all these years in Washington, I am still too optimistic about my, my politicians. God. You've been but captured. I don't I just don't think that that's what's happening here. I do think the partisan machines on both sides are uh, geared up in ways that are incredibly pernicious and that um there's this belief on both sides that the other guys started it. The other guys already broke all the rules. So the rules don't apply to us anymore. We're allowed to do polit politically motivated prosecutions now because the other guys already did it. What was the first one? No one knows. Um, and so I think. Well, the argument is that Trump uh, disobeyed, flagrantly disregarded political norms around elections and around uh, the uh, around the courts. And you can see that with uh, and that Republicans have done so generally. You can see that starting with Merrick Garland. You can see that with the contested election in 2020 and January 6th and the rest of it. And it's not so much that that Trump pursued exactly the same thing, but that he was a norm breaker. Now, I don't think that that justifies bringing a bad prosecution, bringing a, but a, a lot completely of novel kind of made up case that was built just for Donald Trump. I mean, this is, 
I hesitate always to compare things to, you know, Soviet Russia or whatever, but there is a piece that go. But I'm going to do it here because that it's not about something having to right? do with Star Wars or Lord of the Rings. So please continue. Hey, that jungle well, juice thing was good. The we'll jungle juice get analogy there was in good. A minute. No, but there's uh, one of the old uh, like horrible Soviet apparatchiks that I guarantee you Matt can name had this line, you know, Yuri that, that is somewhat famous, right? Is is like show me the man, you give me the man and I'll show you the crime. And there is a way in Maria. which that was what happened with Donald Trump here was they they said Donald Trump seems crimey. He must have done something. And they went and looked and this is what they found. They found a bunch of misdemeanors that if you string them together after the fact, you can, uh, with some novel legal theorizing, kind of come up with, well, maybe it equals a felony. I also think that there's, you know, Saibi is being rhetorical here, but the worst characterization of you know, what has happened to Trump and the softest characterization of what Trump has done. Um, of course, you know, if you've already put your thumb on the scale there, yes, tampering with the courts, undermining belief in rule of law is definitely worse than like whatever happened with Stormy Daniels and in somebody's, uh, you know, spreadsheet somewhere. Um, but you can equally characterize it the other way around. So all think, spreadsheets are crimes. All spreadsheets mm -hmm. are uh, the failures. rule of law, actually. I'm objectively pro spreadsheet, as it will yeah. surprise no one on this podcast. The spreadsheet. Nick, can you can you walk us Probably through not. a little bit? Imagine someone disagrees with you. It happens. Who I've does? Heard on the internet. Uh, okay. Just someone. Like a, 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 it's a rhetorical, hypothetical, um, uh, logical. Um, uh, and that someone disagrees with you. Um, uh, can you walk them through what your fears are of the aftermath of this, especially given that, um, not everyone is like Trump. Um, I, I see a lot of, uh, sort of pushback on the, on the formulation that you had before or the formulation that JD Trucilli mm -hmm. uh, had this morning talking about how this is going to lead us to a banana republic at tit for tat prosecutions all the time. We're just going to go uh, all the way down Costa Rica style and just jail every single person as they're leaving office as a uh, golden ticket. Um, uh, but people will, will say, well, uh, that's not true because not everyone's like Trump. Trump is, as Peter Suderman has pointed out, super duper crimey. Um, and so because he's a one off, we're not going to see that. Can you try to convince people of what the bad aftermath is of uh, an action like what Alvin Bragg did and was able to accomplish? It in yeah, th that's a, uh, a fair criticism that just because something happens once doesn't mean it's ushering a new age of something. But. Having said that, when you start to look at, um, you know, uh, and this is shifting uh, gears a little bit, but when you look at Russiagate, okay, and, and, the, and the main idea behind Russiagate is twofold. One was that, Trump, you know, one of the reasons Trump is crimey is because he was actively colluding with Putin in order to change the outcome of the 2016 election. That's kind of like the, the you know, one version of Russiagate. Absolutely unfounded. Nobody, everybody who has tried to find anything, you know, that comes close to that is, uh, you know, they've come a cropper. Uh, the the softer version of that is social media was determinative in Trump winning and beating Hillary Clinton. So then it created a system where it's like that keeps getting perpetuated. We have to regulate social media. Uh, we have to be on top of it. We have to get rid of disinformation, misinformation, et cetera. All of that led to a world uh, plus the pandemic where Twitter and Facebook were actively working with the government. And it's not a simple thing of like the government telling these companies what to do. It's partly these companies asking and beseeching the government, how do we handle this kind of stuff? You create an environment now where social media is completely untrustworthy and whoever is taking it over is you know, whoever comes into political power is trying to control it and regulate it and restrict it in various ways. And that includes Republican you know, governors in places like Florida and Texas have passed legislation, which has mostly been blocked, you know, trying to control the business models and, and the algorithmic you know, secret sauce of social media. And you have um, you have Democratic governors and you also have you know, people in Congress trying to do this all the time. So once you get into this kind of thing, you're going to see it start happening more and more. And it might not be 
that whoever the Republican equivalent of Alvin Bragg is, wherever that is, is going to start filing nuisance suits against other people. But this is, you know, this is the world we live in, where it just destroys trust and confidence um, in the elections and in the institutions and the ability of candidates to actually get on with politicking and, uh, you know, trying to win or lose based on their own, uh, you know, merits and, and demerits. Uh, one thing that's just uh, I still can't wrap my brain around entirely is that the prosecution in its successful right uh, closing arguments um, suggested to the jury that who knows, maybe these reimbursements to Michael Cohen for the hush money that he gave to Stormy Daniels, um, uh, maybe that influenced, maybe that cost the election. Maybe that was the uh, deciding factor in the election in uh, 2016. But then you open it up like, and you know, and this comes down to, well, what about the Hunter Biden laptop case then? You know, and again, I'm not trying to relitigate all this stuff, but that was blocked on social media. If that had not been blocked, you know, one argument is because it was blocked, it ended up, you know, there was a Streisand effect and we talked about it a lot more, but it was blocked, you know, and maybe that would have changed things. And you go back to James Comey, like, you know, uh, I mean, and Matt, I guess you could say like, you know, there's a, you know, what do we call them? October surprises, um, you know, yeah. and that's an old motif, none of which has actually been substantiated in any meaningful way. Um, but that kind of thing begets the next one, the next one, the next one. And it changes the dynamics of society. And I think, you know, our elections are better when, you know, and it's not to saying like late breaking scandal should always be interesting. Um, and of interest to candidates and things like that. But, you know, we we live in a world now that has become so deeply conspiratorial uh, and this type of thing fuels it without actually, I think, you know, really adding much of substance to any kind of conversation. It's a very bad look when the partisans who are warning that if the other guys win, it might be the end of democracy are pursuing a case that is tailor made for one person who uh, a case that almost certainly would not have been prosecuted against any other person, any other citizen in the country. And then when that case, when that person is convicted, that person might end up in, in jail. There is at least the possibility here that Donald Trump will be sentenced to jail, um, whether or not he actually ends up right. Like, but like might end up with a jail sentence as a result of this. And then what do you have? You have you have a situation in which a, a partisan prosecutor has per, has pursued a novel uh, one person case against the other ca the other party's presidential candidate. And that person has been uh, sentenced to jail in an election year. That is a bad look for democracy. That is just like it's just like it makes the whole thing look real and feel. And, and in fact, it, it, it makes it more fragile and it makes it less likely that people are going to put their trust in it going forward. And so when Democrats are complaining that, well, you know, if Donald Trump wins, it's going to be the end of democracy in some way. I, I think this is overblown. I'm, I'm also concerned about Donald Trump and election denial. But like they are participating in this and making this making this standoff uh, worse, I think, by pursuing cases like this. Catherine, um, within uh, minutes of the verdict, uh, Hillary Clinton was out with uh, with merch of uh, mugs saying something along the lines of like, I was right all along. Uh, so uh, was she? No, Jesus, no. About hardly anything was she right all along. Um, I, I do think the it is worth noting the do si do of um, the lock her up folks who mm. are now the it is unseemly to propose the locking up of people who are or would like to be president. Um, that that really was a like, OK, everybody switch sides. Our parties say switch sides. And then the, uh, there was like a changing of the guard. Um Everyone who does that should be embarrassed, very, very embarrassed. Uh, uh, and they unfortunately are not. Um, you know, I, I this this idea that any different fact set, like the the um, you know, putting up barriers to any kind of different fact set in the in the pre-election window is the same thing as election interference, I think is very, very dumb and is going to take us bad places, right? Like, if only people had known fact X, my guy would have won. That's true for an infinite number of facts, like not to be Peter Suderman, but like we cannot ask judges to be Dr. Strange looking at every single path of every single, 
you know, outcome of the flap of the butterfly's wings and then choosing the one where justice is done, that's not going to be a possibility. Um, election interference Everything, is a thing. Everything, everywhere, all at once. But yes. throw in Legal a reference edition. to Dormammu, the dread Dormammu, please. I would, I would love to, uh, but I think you have, uh, okay. so we'll call it a day. Um, <laughs> Indeed. Election interference is a thing, and and just people don't know the exact set of facts I would like them to know, and nothing else is not election interference. I so when are the, all those Matt? When are all those mailboxes that were you know captured and then hostaged into upstate New York during the was that the twenty sixteen or twenty twenty election? Remember, I, I guess 2020, it was I think it's twenty twenty because it was COVID, right? Yeah. But we had all uh, those mailboxes hoarding them, yeah. I think. Yeah, that, that are somewhere in the tunnels up by Albany. Uh, you know, when are they going to be released? I mean, this is the good news about all of the, per, you know, specific election hysteria around stuff. It disappears after the election because by and large people recognize, you know, we have very good elections. I mean, like, or very accurate is that elections. True. I'm not sure that's happening I, this time. I've got a storage um, I, garage I, full of uh, postal no, service mailboxes uh, and old Double Dragon arcade games. Yeah, and uh, die bold, I, uh, uh, die bold election machines from uh, 2004. Sure. I actually used sought the after double, gallery. Yeah, yeah, I used the Double Dragon. I took the motherboard out and used that to hack a voting machine. So when you okay, when you start uh, when you pull about. the lever, it's like, oh, that's the punch button now. Um, okay, uh, <laughs> let's go on to our listener email. Of the Everybody week. remembers uh, here, Double uh, Dragon. Come on. I think so. Catherine, are you in the room with him? Can you do something nope. about it? Uh, all right. Uh, we're going to get to our listener email of the week here in a moment. Uh, but first, a sponsored message from our Buenos Amigos over at Donors Trust. Friends, are you passionate about preserving civil liberties and individual freedom? Yes. Uh, do you desire to support organizations that uphold these principles yet find it a struggle to navigate the complex world of charitable giving? Here's the perfect solution for you. A giving account with Donors Trust. A giving account, also known as a donor advised fund, is a simple, secure and tax advantaged way for libertarian givers like y'all to support the causes you care about most. With a donor advised fund, you can make a contribution, receive an immediate tax deduction, and recommend grants to your favorite charities over time. Best of all, you retain control over how your charitable dollars are invested, ensuring that it aligns with your values and goals. Whether you're passionate about defending free speech, protecting property rights, or promoting limited government, a giving account with Donors Trust empowers you to make meaningful impact. To get started, go to www.donorstrust.org roundtable and begin making even more of a difference in the fight for freedom. That's www.donorstrust.org.roundtable. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right. Reminder, uh, email your short queries to roundtable at reason dot com. This one comes from Kevin Weiss, who writes, hello, all. So I feel like I align with libertarians. He capitalizes the L on most things, drugs, small government, individual rights, etc. However, I rather strongly disagree with the anti-war sentiment. It's not that I want to rush into war, but I am in complete support of sending weapons, bought or gifted, not sure I care, to our allies fighting wars. I care so much about it, it is almost the only thing that would make me vote for Trump, which I have completely taken off the table, or so I thought. I voted for Biden last time, but with him sometimes seeming like he will withhold weapons to Israel, I have started to look for another option was really hoping the LP candidate would be someone I could vote for. However, it seems the first thing always mentioned about him is that he is anti-war. So if a top priority for me is that a president should send weapons to Israel and Ukraine, does that mean I am just stuck voting for someone who I basically loathe on everyone, everything else. Uh, Catherine, you like to vote. What yeah, I mean, I would argue that we are perhaps all just stuck voting for someone that we basically loathe no matter what our issue of uh, priority is. Um, so I think there's a couple things going on here. First is, um, while it is true that Biden has softened slightly on his support for Israel, he is still um, almost indistinguishable, I would say, from the kind of mainline 
Republican position on support for Israel. Um, there is, you know, he he is one degree off of what is what has been a longstanding fundamentally bipartisan agreement. Um, I do not anticipate that a second Biden term would see him um, acting any differently from his long political career, which has been extremely pro-Israel. So on the Israel question, at least, I think what you're seeing from him is a little bit of gamesmanship in the lead up to an election and that he will almost certainly continue to give and sell weapons to Israel. Ukraine, I think, is a little bit trickier of a question um, that's more subject to ongoing political wins, also more subject to congressional uh, say so. So there's that. Um, Donald Trump, meanwhile, I don't really know what he would do in terms of foreign policy as president, and I'm not sure that he knows. So I would say if you genuinely find Trump objectionable otherwise and Biden OK otherwise, which it's not clear from your question that you do, but um, or if you generally find uh, the Libertarian Party candidate OK otherwise, um, I I think I don't think that that there's a, a so much daylight between Trump and Biden on what would actually happen as a practical matter with respect to U.S. support for those two conflicts. Isn't, I could be wrong. Isn't Nick, uh, you... Trump's position on Ukraine basically, well, it, it wouldn't have happened if I'd been president. Right. And that, that that's his, on Israel, know, too. Israel. Right. That doesn't tell you what he would do if he were president with the thing that did happen. He'll be less interested in giving aid to Ukraine. Um, I think he's been. He will be less interested, about... but also, I could easily imagine some kind of passing political gain in doing so, and he would change his mind. Nick, what? Uh, to to uh, basically echo what Catherine was saying, um, <clears throat> there's you know not a lot of difference uh, you know between them in terms of what they're going to be able to do. I think uh, because Congress tends to be pretty uh, strong in this, as well as public opinion and things like that. I think objectively, Trump was a better president for the Middle East than uh, Biden has been. Uh, you know, part of that is because of October 7th, we don't know who, you know, <clears throat> what would have happened to, if Trump was in office and things like that. But the Abraham Accords was probably the most, you know, both, and this happened before him, but uh, the withdrawal of troops from Iraq, and even though we have some still in the area, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but between that and the Abraham Accords, uh, Donald Trump was forcing the Gulf states to recognize their common need for an alliance uh, across religious and uh, kind of tribal lines in a way that, you know, was not, was very good. I think it was, it was the most promising uh, improvement in that region in decades. Um, so you, you got to think about that. He's clearly hostile to Zelensky on some, uh, you know, uh, on some profound level, but he also is a savior. So I can't imagine, you know, Trump would work, I believe, to try and uh, reach, uh, you know, endpoints in both of these wars, because that would uh, puff up his egotism if he could do it or not. I don't know. Um, I would say uh, somebody who generally is anti-war and anti-intervention and things like that, um, I recognize a lot of people within uh, who are libertarian leaning. Chase Oliver is very outspoken. You know, he calls the Israeli actions in Israel uh, or the Israeli actions in Gaza genocide, and that's going to be off-putting to an enormous uh, number of people. Um, but I would think if you are basically libertarian, because this is the question, I think making a vote for a libertarian candidate in this election especially is important because it's a rejection of a duopoly that is imploding into itself where you have two old semi-deranged men who are not that fundamentally different in how they do everything, which is that they want more of everything all the time. Um, I think, you know, the argument to vote libertarian, independent of, you know, your position on um, on foreign policy or any one thing is probably stronger than ever. Nick and Catherine covered the question of who you should vote for, I think, better than I can. I think if you, the thing that you're concerned about is sending aid to Ukraine and Israel, then you should just look at Donald Trump and Joe Biden and Chase Oliver and vote for the person who you think is most likely to send aid to Ukraine and Israel. And you're going to have to make that determination. But since you were brave enough, and I actually want to, I mean that this probably sounded sarcastic. I mean that very seriously. Hashtag so like, brave. Um, 
I mean that very seriously. Like this is like a, this is a good question, and I appreciate you writing uh, writing this in um, to to say. However, I rather strongly disagree with the anti war sentiment to a bunch of libertarians. Right? Like I, there are a lot of people who uh, who claim to be libertarians who they're. I think in many ways they're not that much. They're not very libertarian, but they're actually anti war, like for real, and that like is that drives a lot of libertarian sentiment. So this is a little bit of a different thing. And here's what I will just say to to someone writing in with with that phrase in their email is, if you are a libertarian in all the other ways, you are skeptical of government power or of the of government competence. And I would just encourage you to think a little, just a little about whether if the government is incompetent, uh, if it abuses its power domestically and in, in a bunch of like when it does stuff here at home, maybe when it's got the bombs and et cetera, and the guns and the soldiers over in other places, uh, maybe there's some of that going on too. And so I don't know. I would just encourage you to just be maybe a little less confident in your in your anti-war skepticism. Um, think about it just a little bit. But thank you for the question. Appreciate it. I'll just add the context uh, about Chase Oliver and the Libertarian Party, which is to say, Chase Oliver, yes, he's uh, that he emanated from uh, anti-war activism. That's where he. His libertarian origin story is that I think he was a Democrat before and then uh, discovered libertarianism and um, and but like he started off as an anti-war activist. That is the mainstream libertarian party view. Uh, if you look at their um, party platform, which has been pretty consistent over time, it is what uh, most uh, other um, political factions in this country would describe as isolationist, whether you agree with that, with that as an epithet or, or whatever. Um, uh, it is pretty radically anti-intervention. Generally speaking, you're going to get boos and hisses at a Libertarian Party convention if you say something like, yeah, I think we should belong to the United Nations. Um, uh, uh, the only exceptions really to having Chase Oliver-like views on foreign policy among Libertarian Party presidential candidates was the string of ex uh, Republican office holders, uh, Bob Barr first, and then Gary Johnson uh, in succession, and they were for a, a much more slimmed back uh, U.S. military involvement in the world. They were big critics of the Iraq War and etc. Um, they just uh, were moderate uh, compared to the general Libertarian Party position. But if anyone else had won that nomination, uh, Michael Rechtenwald, Jacob Hornberger, uh, Joshua Smith, anyone else, um, they would have been equally. George Jorgensen in 2020 was very radically anti-war. It's That's where the party is at. So um, the party comes with things that uh, it's, it is a radical organ. It always has been. Uh, people who vote for it are probably less uh, radical than the people who organize it. And that's also been true for a long time. And they greatly outnumber uh, the actual members of the party. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind as you're uh, making these deliberations. And I would just reiterate that I think Donald Trump is, is while being more unpredictable, including that he did uh, uh, send a lot of aid to Ukraine, although lots of weird things happening around Ukraine during the Trump presidency, um, but uh, rhetorically, he's much uh, less uh, firmly behind uh, Zelensky and uh, the opposing Vladimir Putin than uh, Biden is. And Biden, as Nick was alluding to before, um, uh, has been, I think, one way to think about Biden is that, yes, uh, Catherine's right. He's been had a half a century of being a pretty stalwart pro-Israel person, but also the um, the uh, rising young core of the Democratic Party are much, much different on that issue. And he feels pressure from that and will act, uh, including this weekend on Friday, he unveiled a new peace plan, which Israel re rejected out of hand immediately. Um, but he feels uh, sort of pressured to. Uh, acknowledge that in a way that I don't think Donald Trump does. Um, so those are just some contextual things and do what you don't like. Don't you think that, All right. um, that pressure is going to just sorry? like evaporate from the body in, of second term Joe Biden instantly? Like he will never think that thought again? I don't know. Maybe I'm I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, you, you know, uh, I've, I've often made the um, analogy of uh, Biden and this issue to uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was governor of California being constantly harassed by the California Nurses Association. It's a real ball busting left leaning union who would go to every single place that he ever would go to, including like, uh, you know, middle school graduations and just heckle him and boo him. And it got to him. 
the guy like likes to be popular and he stopped picking fights with public sector unions after um, after a couple of years in office and also because he had some uh, uh, ballot initiatives that were try attempting to scale back their power and they failed. Um, but that combination, um, he was alive to being influenced by the hecklers. And Joe Biden, every single place that he has gone to, um, to the extent that Operation Bubble Wrap allows him to go anywhere, um, he has been pretty uh, regularly uh, confronted with this. And also his vice president is a uh, uh, to if she ever gets near him, uh, mentions that as well. She's pretty uh, strongly anti-Israel's position. In I would war. also, though, uh, you know, let's not offload it onto younger Democrats the way Biden will figure out his foreign policy. America, you know, and this is something that uh, Jacob Siegel, who a uh, number of us read, and I've interviewed him a couple times. He's been on uh, uh, Just Asking Questions or the live stream before that. But he points out that America, you know, American presidents and American Congress, we fund Israel tremendously, uh, but we also fund Egypt and Jordan and we give money to Saudi Arabia and we have alliances with the UAE, et cetera. Um, fundamentally, the U.S. foreign policy is always kind of bizarre. And like, you know, one way of seeing it towards Israel is that we are a client state of Israel and we, we are their muscle and we do what they want. Uh, that's kind of the anti-Semitic uh, you know, kind of right wing and to some degree left wing view. But then the other one is that we make a lot of uh, uh, demands on Israel uh, because we are managing the reason, region and they are not our only client in the area. So, um, you know, I, I think this is one of the reasons why Trump may have been more effective there is that he was actually willing to pull out of the region and let the people who are actually there do more. And that's, he may not have thought that through or anything like that, but it, it's important because there will be more regional stability and I think better outcomes for everybody involved when you have the people who are actually uh, situated there figuring out how best to, uh, you know, how best to work and ally with themselves in the region, especially against, uh, you know, outside forces like Iran. Um, so. I think there's an article in the print magazine of Reason along some of those lines. Uh, you should go to Reason.com slash subscribe to get that in your mailbox before the other people do. All right, let's go to our uh, uh, end of end of this section section. I don't know what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that uh, the Trump trial has soaked up a lot of energy and attention, but other stuff is in the news. Uh, and since we're libertarians, we're annoying and we like to remind people of other stuff in the news that's actually important while the dog is chasing the squirrel of American politics. You get me. Um, so let's go a quick round if we can, please. Catherine, what is something that happened in the last six, seven days that's important that is getting under oxygenated in the news? Huge, cycle? huge change on immigration in the works uh, already underway to some extent. Um, particularly asylum seekers at the southern border. Um, Biden is repositioning in a way that he thinks is going to help uh, protect him in the upcoming election against claims that he is soft on immigration, soft on illegal immigration, soft on asylum seekers, whatever it is. Um, this is... Um, you know, this is going to basically result in a lot more people being turned away very, very quickly uh, at our border if it goes through. Um, he's already, um, you know, we have some evidence that he's already sort of trying to clear the roles of asylum seekers. Um, the New York Post casts this as Biden lets hundreds of thousands of asylum seekers go free unwatched in the United States. I would cast it as Biden leaves uh, tens of thousands of asylum seekers in an even worse legal limbo than they were in before. Uh, they are now no longer um, in the case system at all, but still don't have uh, the ability to obtain work permits, for example, here in the country. So um, I would say it, this is a pretty important. Biden is currently making a hash of the lives of many, many people who would like to come here seeking asylum. He seems to be doing it largely for political gain, which he will almost certainly not realize because no one cares about the details of this stuff. And Republicans are just going to say he's soft on immigration and that will be enough. Peter, what's a news item that requires or that should have more attention? So last week, BYD, which is the largest maker of uh, electric vehicles in the world. It's a Chinese company announced two new models. 
uh, both of which have incredibly long ranges on a single charge, 1,300 miles. So you can drive across a large portion of the United States that is well over a full day's worth of driving on a single charge. And even better, those vehicles are priced if you convert the cost into American dollars at about $14,000 each. So dirt cheap EVs, uh, plug-in hybrid EVs with incredibly long ranges. And you would think that President Biden would be very excited about getting American consumers access to these vehicles because he has made transitioning the U.S. auto fleet to all electric a big priority and has tried to push for, you know, 50 percent of cars should be electric by sometime in the 2030s, except American consumers are almost certainly never going to have an opportunity to purchase these vehicles because Biden pursued like a continued Donald Trump's tariffs on imported vehicles from China, raising those tariffs to 102 percent just a couple of weeks ago. And so even as there are innovations out there in the marketplace, Biden is preventing those from happening. Meanwhile, just as a sort of secondary piece of the same news, the, uh, the the Biden administration has earmarked seven point, or I should say, the Biden administration working with Democrats in Congress has earmarked seven point five billion dollars for electric vehicle chargers uh, throughout the country. And as of uh, as of last week, eight have been built. So that's uh, that's uh, that's less than a billion dollars per charger so far. That seems like a pretty good deal. <laughs> Um, Nick, what's a undercovered? Uh, uh, story? Lenny Kravitz is 60 years old and he's been celibate for nine years and is in the best shape of his life uh, for an aging America. I think we need to study Lenny Kravitz a whole lot more. I mean, didn't he already go through a long I, I, period after Lisa Yeah, Bonet? I believe he did. And then he fell off the wagon and then got back on it, if I'm remembering correctly. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I think. He, and he's still riding horses shirtless, oh, yeah. shirtless in slow motion on. No, and it beaches, looks good. Unlike, you know, it's, it's, you know, when yeah. uh, Putin or most politicians do that kind of stuff, they look like the guy getting shot in the stomach with the cannonball where it's just. You know, he actually looks better in slow motion, in super slow motion. And of course, that also comes, uh, you know, just to keep it where it should be, which is, you know, entertainment idols as guides to life. You know, this also was happening at the same time when uh, Ben Affleck and uh, J-Lo are calling it quits on their uh, return, uh, you know, on their second bite at the apple. Are, yeah. Are they? Oh, so, yeah. I had so much hope for that, really. Yeah. Um celibate uh, high someone... end watch collector Lenny Kravitz yeah, is how we now... refer to him, but I repeat myself. Yeah, now the uh the I, I mean right. we should uh, do a whole show <laughs> about the uh idiocy of uh high end watch collecting. It's going to have to wait for another time in the uh, That market has it collapsed, shouldn't. guys. Yeah. Let's let self-love yeah. rule. Um, as Lenny taught us, um, my uh, uh, vote, my nominee for undercover story on Friday or this week, actually, Dr. Anthony Fauci is going to be testifying mm. in front of Congress about various things, lab leak, especially on Friday. The House uh, Republicans released transcript from an interview they'd done with him in January. And we kind of had known uh, the content of that. But now we have the full transcript in which. Uh, this is what he said about the six foot rule. Remember that six foot rule? You know, those stickers you see sometimes still it, it, like your Home Depot or the subway or, or whatnot. Um, uh, uh, it sort of just appeared that six feet is going to be the distance is what Fauci said, uh, cross-examined from that. Uh, he said it was an empiric decision that wasn't based on data. So the Centers for Disease Control had as the official recommendation in the country until August of 2022 that the best thing to do was to have uh, people uh, on average of six feet of distance between one another. This had very direct uh, impact, especially on K through 12 schools being closed. Um, and there was a moment of time that we wrote about extensively at Reason in March of 2021, uh, February and March. When uh, Joe Biden, who came to office promising to follow the science, he's not going to get this thing politicized, uh, had his new CDC director, Rochelle Walensky, come out and say, yeah, we're going to have new guidelines for the schools and we're going to keep that six foot rule. 
Um, and she was someone who, in her position as an epidemiologist, advised people in July of 2020 that the six feet rule was too onerous because it kept schools closed and that was a bad outcome and it wasn't going to necessarily help any health outcomes of kids by keeping those schools closed. They'd be much more dangerous, actually, um, if they were not in those kind of communal settings. Um, this is a type of scandal, a type of this is why uh, you have uh, populist anti-elite uprisings and a sense of low trust in institutions because those institutions lied to us and uh, lied to us in ways that created damaging outcomes for literally millions of people, especially those who live in places that are likely to have yard signs that said, in this house, we believe in the science or whatnot. Um, it is a scandal. It's outrageous. And there's really interesting lack of significant, I would say, journalistic interest in relitigating things that journalists said were absolutely true and incontrovertible back in 2020 and 2021. Um, and some people, uh, including a lot of people at Reason, were questioning by the summer of 2020 and branded as lunatics at the time. So um, screw you, Fauci. All right, let's get to We will, in of, fact, uh, be relitigating that journalistically in the pages of Reason magazine. There we go. Just in case you were wondering uh, who years. still has some interest there. No, uh, it sort of just two appeared as such a great line. That's what exactly what I said to my wife when she asked about the $300 bottle of whiskey that she found on the bar. It sort of just appeared. It sort of just appeared. Uh, I'm going right, to use that excuse sort of forever now. Let's manifest our end of podcast, what we have been consuming in the cultural arena. Catherine, why don't you lead us off? I would love to. I am reading the second book uh, in a sort of series that I recommended earlier, um, The Committed, which is uh, also by Viet Thanh Nguyen. Uh, it's uh, yet another super excellent kind of action-packed literary-ish novel. Uh, this one is set in the 80s in France. Uh, our hero is once again a uh, Vietnamese uh, or half Vietnamese man of uh, divided sympathies. And um, I'm so into these books that I uh, had to go out for Vietnamese food this weekend. Um, so that's that's where we're at. Um, this book uh, addresses to me the signal and most interesting result, perhaps, of all of colonialism in all of the world, which is the banh mi, uh, the delicious French bread Vietnamese sandwich. Um, but uh, more generally, I would say uh, if you, like me, are wildly skeptical of any literary treatment that purports to deal with colonialism because you are sick to death of that shit, um, these books are uh, they should they should evade your your filter on that stuff um, because they are so good. As we talked about last time, The Sympathizer is the previous book. It's been turned into a, a series that is uh, seems to be doing well. Um, but uh, I recommend The Committed as well. Uh, Nick, what did you consume? Uh, I uh, consumed an oral history uh, called of the Village Voice called The Freaks Came Out to Write by Tricia Romano. And it is uh, subtitled The Definitive History of the Village Voice, the radical paper that changed American culture. And, uh, you know, the Village Voice is uh, generally recognized and I think correctly recognized as the first alt weekly uh, came out in the uh, early 50s or mid 50s. And um, it's fascinating to put it in the context of uh, more intellectual monthly magazines or maybe not monthly, but magazines like National Review and Dissent, uh, which also came out then commentary rose to prominence. But the Village Voice helped to define an alternative sensibility, uh, not just simply in New York City, but in the media. It positioned itself in uh, in opposition to places like the New York Times, but also at you know at the time in New York City, the Daily News was the bigger newspaper, uh, and uh, the New York Post was also kicking around, and there were like you know ten other dailies and things like that, and the Voice covered politics, local politics, from a very confrontational and oppositional point uh, through. It it ultimately stopped kind of real publication. There's a version of it still kicking around, but it died for good in about 2018. Um, and uh, it also spawned a million wonderful alternative uh, weeklies kind of all over the country, but it combined muckraking politics, particularly looking at local government and corruption and bad behavior and, and incompetent and inefficient and ineffective behavior on the part of local governments. 
uh, with an incredible back of the book sensibility, um, uh, where uh, the village voice, you know, would when other uh, you know uh, traditional media organizations would be talking about, you know, the the blockbuster movies that came out, they were looking at independent movies and not simply foreign movies that had a certain amount of cachet, but locally grown short weird loops and things like that in an experimental film community in New York and beyond. Uh, they were among the first people to openly talk about alternative lifestyles, whether that meant dressing weird or having sex in unconventional ways and things like that. So um, it's a fantastic history of a newspaper. And personally, uh, a lot of people, if you grew up in New York or the New York area, the Village Voice was kind of a starter paper on recognizing that there was a world of, you know, as it's in the title, freaks or people who lived different lives and were not ashamed of it or were not uh, um, unwilling to kind of live openly in their own individuality and, and eccentricity. So it's fascinating that way. Uh, Matt, uh, we've talked, I believe, on this podcast about kind of the end of the alt-weekly era, uh, which in a profound way, it has ended partly for the same reason lesbian bars are disappearing. Um, this it, it normalized something and the need for the type of alt weekly that the village voice represented doesn't really, it's not as strong as it used to be. The, the, uh, uh, economic model also changed because it was based on classifieds first and foremost, uh, which have kind of disappeared for various reasons. The other thing that I think people who are interested in media history and whatnot will find particularly interesting is that two people who we at reason have written very sympathetically about, uh, because they have been railroaded by people like Kamala Harris and other um, uh, legal, uh, you know, vultures, uh, Michael Lacey and, Lacey and Jim Larkin, the people who created Backpage, as well as the New Times change that was based in Phoenix for a long time, are basically the villains of this story because they came in and they were the last real owners of the Village Voice. And it's an interesting critique of their ownership of the Village Voice, where they were not from New York, and the writer Trisha Romano, who was at the at the uh, Voice for a long time, uh, kind of pulls together voices that argue that they did not, they could not create a good Village Voice because they fundamentally disliked New York City and New York culture and kind of what the Village Voice stood for. Um, it's very interesting to read in that uh, in that light, even as the lack of sympathy for the unbelievably politically and kind of ideologically motivated persecution of uh, Larkin and Lacey, which led to the, you know, the suicide of one of them uh, is, you know, is very unbecoming, but a fascinating book. The Freaks came out to write the definitive history of the Village Voice, the radical paper that changed American culture. Uh, two quick points. One is that the New Times chain, uh, the Village Voice media was their big rival. And so by buying the Village Voice, they conquered their rival. So if there was going to be bad blood no matter what. And Mike Lacey is a, uh, is a, uh, a but bit of a cowboy. But you gain the world uh, and uh, lose your soul, you know, and it's not the uh, first time that uh, it may be that they, ex you know, it, yeah, it's it's interesting. It's a real clash of culture. Uh, and. The other is that I believe the book, and I was looking at my bookshelf and it's not there, so someone obviously stole it, um, but uh, that uh, is pretty interesting about the rise of the alternative press. It's called Uncovering the 60s by Abe mm. Greenwald, I want to say, um, uh, that it covers some of that, not just the Village Voice type of alt-weeklies and the LA yeah. Weekly and the other big ones, but also the actual super underground press mm -hmm. that was the uh, alternatives to the alternatives, and it's a... Uh, a real rip roar and uh, read, so check it out. Uh, Peter, I watched the debut season of Fallout, a show on Amazon Prime that is based on the incredibly popular video game series from Bethesda Softworks. So I recommended the fourth game in the series, uh, Fallout 4, during our live pod in, Bo in Boston. And the show very much participates in a lot of the same ethos. Um, it's a good extension of the games. It doesn't adapt a story directly from any of the video games. Instead, uh, creates its own story within the continuity of those games. It, it's set in a post-apocalyptic America uh, in this case, it's set out on the West Coast. Um, the, some of the games are set in Las Vegas and Boston and Washington, D.C., but you have this sort of L.A.-based story here. Um, and 
at its best, it's gets the the show gets the game's vibe, which is just very skeptical of essentially all social and civil authorities in the games that is very much directed at governments or quasi governmental organizations or just sort of factions that are claiming the mandate of authority to govern. And it's in the the games, you you see that virtually all of those factions are in some way ridiculous or awful. Either they are hyper-violent or they are too obsessed with their own sort of intellectual capacity or they're just sort of naive and ridiculous in whatever way. Um, and you see that in the show uh, very much uh, late in the season. There's a, an episode where one of the characters is dragged into this little hilarious post-apocalyptic shack and uh, on the outside of it, there's like a wooden hand-painted sign misspelled that just says, the government. Right. And it's like, oh, here's the local government. And it's like, oh, wait, actually, that's sort of how government kind of works is they just put up a sign and say we're the government then the authority. Right. And you get some of that. The The games are much more sort of, I think, straightforwardly libertarian, even if none of the creators will actually ever say this. The show is a little bit more anti-capitalist. It puts more of the, the emphasis on how corporations are to blame um, in the way that it tells its story. But it's still kind of I think fundamentally an anti-authoritarian show filled with very blackly funny satire sort of of, uh, of of kind of ridiculous Americana and the ways that Americana persists even after the idea of America has been destroyed. It's a pretty good, um, it's, it's very difficult I think to do a, a sci-fi comedy successfully. This manages to do it. It's a great sci-fi show. It's very funny. It's a, it's a good satire of America and it's a very good adaptation of one of my favorite video game series. It's Fallout. It's on Amazon. Amazon Prime. So for mine, I've mentioned previously that uh, my slide uh, towards senescence has involved uh, transforming from a uh, Ken Burns hater to an avid consumer of Ken Burns documentaries. Uh, and as such, I just finished and greatly, greatly enjoyed and recommended uh, The Roosevelt's An Intimate History, a uh, seven parter uh, about I could just hear the scoffing people, a uh, seven parter about uh, the family, the Roosevelt's Teddy. FDR and Eleanor. I knew a lot about Teddy. I didn't know much about FDR and Eleanor. Um, and uh, and it was a, uh, I think, the correct way or an interesting way to talk about it in terms of uh, a family portrait. Eleanor, of course, Teddy's niece. It's creepy all around. Um, and just the uh, frantic energy of these people in whether it's overcoming personal adversity or just imposing their will on the country and sh reshaping it. There's a, a great uh, quote from George Will in there, who is the absolute hero of this documentary, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is it is the best performance I can remember of a talking head in a documentary is George Will in this uh, in this piece. Like he is the the kind of voice of conscious reminding conscience reminding us that in many ways uh, not great. Uh, they expanded the powers of the presidency. They went on personal crusades. Uh, they did bad things in addition to uh, doing some good things. And he's fair minded, too, and, and pointing out uh, when their uh, modus operandi was what uh, the country needed and uh, and couldn't probably have come from anybody else. Just a really bravura performance. But he talks about how like the presidency is a glove. Sometimes the hand is bigger than the glove and it stretches it out and remains stretched uh, ever since. And the Roosevelt's Teddy and FDR uh, did as much stretching as just about anyone else did. Uh, but very moving, uh, like all things Ken Burns, you know his politics, you can feel them. Um, uh, we had good uh, coverage of the time uh, of documentary. Damon Root was pretty critical of aspects of it. It doesn't linger too much on the Japanese internment and some other things. It's uh, pretty uh, straightforwardly pro New Deal and doesn't give a lot of respect to people who are critics of it. Um, and so forth. Yet, uh, as he does in most of his documentaries, Burns is uh, talented enough at presenting the story that allows for other interpretations. Yeah, the aforementioned George Will part of it and just will get you thinking about relationships and a bunch of other things besides um, really interesting and, and, uh, and moving. I uh, recommend it very highly. Um, that is all the recommendations, unless Nick wants to just throw a dart at my forehead from rep <laughs> recommending the Roosevelt's. Uh, um, otherwise, um, we, uh, I just does it mention uh, Alice Roosevelt at all? It does. Uh, who yeah. seems like a real pepper pot, a loose cannon. Teddy's yeah. uh, daughter uh, who liked yeah. the finery and, and wandered all around. And she seemed kind of like a Trump 
uh, Trump daughter. Uh, uh, yeah, she's the really she's like Mary of, Trump, but but good, right? Uh, she was uh, really interesting, uh, and then Anne uh, Roosevelt who uh, very poignantly was sort of running the White House because Eleanor had kind of checked out uh, running the the sort of social engagements of the White House, uh, was smuggling in FDR's first mistress into the White House without telling her mom about it towards the end. Uh, and uh, and Eleanor finds out, uh, this is spoiler alert, uh, finds out uh, at the same moment that she, she uh, sees FDR's dead body in Warm Springs. Um, so just like all kinds of crazy. So stuff, it's uh, one of there, but, it's a good day for her, really. <laughs> fantastic day uh that's all the time we have running late uh thanks for listening all of our podcasts including the great ones uh are at reason.com slash podcasts uh nick you certainly have some event that you would like to hype up in the new york city area oh i sure do uh a week from tomorrow on june 11th we're going to be doing a live reason interview taping with Corey DeAngelis, who is uh you know kind of the uh uh, the Lenny Kravitz of school choice. Uh, he claims to be having a child, so I guess he is not very good on celibacy, but he seems to have very good abs. And uh, he's got a new book out called The Parent Revolution, uh, which is all about how school choice is taking off like wildfire and um, comes to uh, see uh, Corey DeAngelis talk about The Parent Revolution. Uh, you can buy tickets at reason.com slash events. Uh, speaking of events, we're going to have a live show in D.C., Washington, D.C., uh, on this Thursday. Thank you for those who bought tickets and even those who went on the waiting list and hope to see some of you there. Uh, and uh, if you like what we do as an organization, think about uh, giving us a tax-deductible donation, even through Donors Trust, if you prefer, at reason.com slash donate. And uh, we'll catch you next week. Thank you. <laughs>